No, thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Chrissy Hodges. Thank you for joining me today. Um, and thank you for visiting my YouTube channel where I talk about mostly OCD, especially pure OCD, which is typically going to be violent, sexual actual boost of thoughts um, with all mental compulsions. Um, I am here today to a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm not usually, but I'm a little nervous. Um, the next reason why I will disclose later, but first I want to get to a guest that I'm going to have on today, um, Lori Johnson, um, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Chrissy. So I'm Lori Johnson, and I'm with In Focus Counseling in the Denver, Colorado area. I specialize in addiction, and OSO is uh, working with mostly cognitive behavioral therapy, and then specifically exposure and response prevention for OCD treatment. Excellent. Thank you for being here. I do want everyone to know that um, we may have some freezing up a little bit between the two of us while we're chatting, but um, have no fear. We're going to keep going. We're powering through and you should be able to still hear the talking. And if it does freeze up, just give us a second and then it should come back on. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about some lived experience that I have with substance use. And then we're gonna go into some questions and have Lori, who is an expert at treating OCD as well as addiction. Um, she's gonna come on and she's gonna answer some questions that we've laid out or some questions that I may come up with as she's talking, which usually happens. Um, and hopefully it'll be informative and that this can help normalize some of the things that you go through or your loved ones go through with OCD. So first, um, without further ado, cause I am, um, stalling and practicing avoidance is I'm going to talk about my own experience with substance use. So this is something, and I've written some notes, but it doesn't matter um, because I'm still nervous. I've been dealing with substance use with alcohol for many, many years, many years. Um, as many of you know, if you've watched my videos, uh, you know that I did suffer from scrupulosity for 12 years where I did nothing wrong. I was trying to stay as pure as possible so God wouldn't punish me with these horrific thoughts that I had. But um, as soon as I got treatment and as soon as I, um, you know, started doing dealing with a lot of the stigma and the shame that comes along with having mental illness, um, grieving the process of what I had been through, I started to use alcohol as a coping skill, mainly because it would temper some anxiety for me, but also because I wanted to be numb with a lot of the grieving process I was going through, um, a lot of the huge emotions I was dealing with. So um, all through my 20s and my 30s, um, I used alcohol as a coping mechanism. I'm now 40, um, and I still do. So couple of reasons why I don't talk about it. Probably the biggest one is the shame. Um, you know, I would say kind of like if someone were to take a Y box quiz to see like if they had OC or not, if I were to take some sort of quiz or, you know, some sort of standardized anything, I would definitely fall under someone who has a substance use disorder. Do I like to stay in denial about it? Sure. What does that make me do? I lie to doctors. I lie when I go in to have stuff done and they say, do you drink every day? Yeah. Well, how much do you drink? Mm, one or two. It makes me feel horrible. But at the same time, I hate when I talk in reality about what I suffer with or what I used to cope. And some people look at me and go, oh, you drink every day? Oh, you drink more than one or two every day? That doesn't help. It makes me feel horrible. It's very similar to me as OCD. Um, when I am in an OCD cycle, I'm dealing with intrusive thoughts. I'm dealing and I'm doing compulsions. It brings temporary relief. But I feel really ashamed. And I feel really embarrassed. And I feel really guilty because I feel like I should have this under control. The same, I feel the same way with substance use. And I also justify it the same way as I do with OCD. Sometimes when I know I need to go get a tune up or I need to do some ERP for OCD is that I say, well, it doesn't interfere with my daily life. I'm still able to exercise. I'm still able to work. So it's not really that big of an issue. 
but I'm here telling you today that it is an issue for me and I do know it's there and um, like emotion sorry like it's just one of those things like it's not like OCD now but what OCD was for me like 10 years ago which was I'm so scared to tell anybody because I'm scared that they'll judge me or I'm scared that they'll look at me different or that they won't take me seriously. This is unexpected, <laughs> but, um, you know, so there isn't really a time that I like to say to people, yes, I deal with OCD and substance use because they're, you know, you, when I grew up, it was very much like people who, dealt with addiction or substance use disorders were, you know, losers or whatever. Or they can't get their life together or, you know, there's always going to be, it's always going to be this path to failure. The same way I used to believe that about mental illness <laughs> until I started coming out and talking about it. And then I met wonderful people like you that are watching and knowing that this is just part of life. And this is part of a struggle of life that yes, you can live with and you can work through and you can get better. Um, so with all that, um, I just wanted to come on today to talk a little bit about how common this is. Um, I work with a lot of people who deal with addiction and OCD and the combination and they, thank goodness, normalize it for me and don't want anyone to know. And they don't want to tell anybody the same way that I don't want to, because there's just this added layer of shame. We're already dealing with a horrendous illness and then on top of it dealing with an addiction piece that feels like there's just one more reason to feel like a failure in life <laughs> I mean I'm saying that's what it feels like for me um, but today now that I've come out and talk about it I will start to include it more in my videos this was just like the hardest part and now I'm sweating really bad <laughs> But um, for those of you that do suffer with substance use and addiction, I just want you to know that you're not alone and I'm right there with you. And um, I'm sorry it took me this long to talk about it, but we all have to do things in our own time. Um, but I will do more education and videos on it and how it affects my life moving forward. So with that said, um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Lori um, and Let's start off. Let's kick it off with the first question, which is, um, you know, Lori, you treat both. You treat individuals with addiction and substance use issues as well as OCD. Um, do you feel like this is a common occurrence for people to suffer with both? There is a lot of overlap with addiction and OCD. I really wanted to thank you for sharing your story. If you know that's one of the common issues within even working in this field is overcoming the stigma and overcoming people's beliefs about this being something about who we are or the willpower that we have or something about our strengths or weaknesses as a person. And it's really a brain-based disease, just like OCD. So I just wanted to say that because I think it's important as clinicians and, and as persons and sufferers and family members to really understand that there are multiple dynamics going on and that it's not a matter of stop versus not or a matter of something that we have to be over in a lot of ways. So really common. Um, there are a lot of overlaps and gaps between the two. Um, a lot of emergence uh, between both of the disorders in being able to help people cope. And it's really common, and, and I really appreciate you sharing your story because people aren't talking about it at all. So therefore, there is no normalization. There is no, hey, wow, this is like, wow, I didn't know I could talk about this here. I have that happen with clients all the time. like oh, okay, wow, this is like a good place to talk about that. You're not going to judge me. You're not going to, you know, say that I need to do something or that I just need to stop. Unfortunately, sometimes clinicians tell people that too um, because they're not trained in these specific areas, whether it's addiction or OCD. Um, I think that brings up a good point, Lori, is that it is scary to tell people because you're just waiting for someone to say, 
oh, you shouldn't do that, which is probably the most shaming thing you could hear. I mean, I also know that I shouldn't do a bunch of compulsions when I have intrusive thought, but sometimes, <laughs> like, sometimes you just want that relief. You want that instant gratification. So that is one of the reasons why I don't talk about it. Now, honestly, like I've never sought professional treatment for it either is I just don't want to be put in that position where you feel like a child talking to a parent going, Oh, you shouldn't do that. Yes. <laughs> don't you know better. Right. And Ugh. at some, in some cities or, or some cultures like drinking is part of culture use is part of culture in some ways. I mean, we're here in Colorado, so it's becoming a different uh, cultural shift with marijuana too. But thinking about this from the perspective of the cycle is that in this, the relief comes at the same point as well, just like doing a compulsion. It's, it's something else that's there. It's relief mm -hmm. and it's, strategy to really dampen that anxiety system. Well, Lori, so with that, um, talk a little bit about some of the similarities of um, having OCD and having a substance use disorder or addiction component. Like, what are the similarities in the two illnesses? Um, definitely the obsessions and compulsions. So if we had an overlay of the obsession with senses if those the turning points are the same meaning that something starts whether it's a trigger or an obsession or a trigger and an obsession at the same time um, with OCD the obsession might be I feel contaminated or dirty or I have this in violent intrusive thought um, with alcohol or use it might be some emotional point of something like you know, today my job was hard. And the only way I know how to cope is by a student. It's like, okay, I need to resolve this inner anxiety and get rid of this feeling. Then we have the relief or the release, whether it's that drink or that substance or um, just being in that environment or that compulsive piece, whether mental or outwardly. And then comes the guilt. Right. Mm -hmm. I started it over. Why couldn't I have stopped this? Here we come in with all of our other self negative talk and intrusive thoughts about who we are as people and why we couldn't follow through on the thing we wanted. But really that whole cycle is brain based. Mm. It's, it's not within control. Intermingle different mechanisms to help the brain create new pathways, just like we do within the whole exposure and response prevention process. But it's not a matter of like whether you want to or not. The goal is like relief, and it's that immediate temporary relief that gets someone bought into that process and really following the brain in that way. So, in my lived experience. Yeah. And so in my, in my lived experience, you know, especially for viewers like that is exactly, you're talking exactly about what happens for me. It is this, you know, there are, you know, I, it, it kind of ebbs and flows for me the same way that OCD will in a way of I'll be really, I'll feel really good about it and feel like I have control or whatever for a while. And then all of a sudden it can, it can tank and then for a week or two weeks or, or so, and then there's this, oh, well, if you just resist tonight, if you just, if just don't do this, or let's just try not to do as much or whatever. And then, you know, I got, sometimes I get to the point where I wake up in the morning and I'm going, oh my gosh, do you feel any, anything from what you drank last night? Do you, is there any hangover? Maybe there's a hangover. And at this point, like I'm starting to make myself sick, <laughs> you know, thinking that, yeah, you know, I'm like, worrying myself into a hangover because I'm so worried that I have a hangover. Oh, the joys of OCD. But then that's when the guilt hits. And then it's like, I get this surge of, Oh, but you, you know, tonight's going to be the night where everything's going to change. And then of course, like, you know, come the time of like five or six o'clock, it's like, Oh my God, like this happened. And so this will give me some instant relief. Absolutely. So it's the cycle continuing to perpetuate and, you know, from a brain-based perspective, 
that's the brain's job is to like get relief, seek something, a stimulus and, and get that response back. And alcohol and other substances are a damper in a lot of ways. A compulsion is a damper to that. Like, oh man, I just had to do that one thing. And now I'm okay for a little bit until it starts coming again. And in reality, it's, you know, I'm sure you and your viewers know the paradoxical um, comparison with that, because in reality, it's creating more anxiety. Even with the alcohol, you wake up the next day and your anxiety is already like boiling at this baseline that it wasn't at the day before. Because that's the withdrawal impact on any level of alcohol, whether you feel it or not. Chemically, your body is trying to process that information and, and detox you. So anxiety comes with that. For some people, depression comes with that too. So it's like starting all these interacting cycles on making OCD worse, making the likelihood of drinking again seem really high. It seems like a great idea. Yeah. It's like, whew, that works really quickly versus like, I'm going to have to continue to face this over and over and like, when will it go away? And then the OCD doubt comes in and is like, okay, is it going to go away? What if it doesn't go away? What does that mean? What does that mean if I drink again tonight? And you have kind of these counterproductive cycles feeding off of each other. I, it seems so complicated. <laughs> and so <laughs> is, is the first key in that and really being able to like come back down the base and be able to talk about things like this eliminating the shame, eliminating the guilt and realize like this is not part of personality or will or moral. This is a way of coping that has been in existence for centuries, honestly. And the impact that it has on people's day to day is, is treacherous, just like OCD. And when dealing with both that overlay is like, oh man, seriously? to deal with this again today so being able to talk about it i think it's the first step well thank you and thank you for and i i just noticed how strength-based you are so i am trauma-informed i mean really it's refreshing <laughs> so let's um i do want to talk about um and Lori and i have had many conversations about this and i think it's really important um one of the reasons why i've you know, whenever I even get to a point where I think I really want to try to get, you know, I want to try to get some help for this, or I want to try to, you know, eliminate this from my life is that I feel like there's this, there's one path and that is sobriety, which there's nothing wrong with sobriety. I'm not saying that there is, but sometimes when you are dealing with something that is a coping mechanism, not only for anxiety, but just in general that you have become accustomed to the idea is the same of, of, for me, I can look at it as when I first started ERP therapy and my therapist saying to me, by the end of this, you won't have, you'll be able to sit in the anxiety about these intrusive thoughts. I was like, yeah, right. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the same way that when I think about being on this journey of I'm going to get this substance use issue under control, well, that means I have to stop drinking tomorrow and just endure it you know, and I can't have another drink for the rest of my life. That doesn't seem, you know, it, 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 I don't seem capable of that at this point. And so I've taught, you know, Lori and I've had many conversations about, you know, the whole, like just stopping and, and that's all it is versus harm reduction, which I never really understood until I've talked to her about it and then done some research. Um, and that, that's more along the lines of ERP where it is kind of slowly introducing you to something, but also you being able to celebrate along the way instead of you weren't sober today, then you suck and you failed, you know, which is kind of where my brain goes. Uh, so Lori, if you could talk a little bit about harm reduction and dealing with substance use, that'd be great. Absolutely. So just like you're talking about, it can be really difficult. It's either this all or nothing, like either I'm sober or I'm not. And especially with persons who struggle with OCD, like we're right back in that black and white thinking and could potentially trigger another obsession cycle about how to perfect sobriety and how to go about this in, in the right way. And it, it's so much potential for people to get stuck. So the harm reduction model is really simply that reducing harm 
So for persons that could vary from um, not driving, reducing like immediate harm, not driving and, and putting others' lives at risk or your own life at risk, um, it could be about reduction per day, reduction per week, um, changing types of alcohol, just really reducing um, the impact that that has. So um, some examples would be a person moving from alcohol, um, straight liquor and doing shots to beer or reducing the amount of intake per day down gradually. So I just want to throw one caveat there is that anyone who is drinking substantial amounts of alcohol and would like to approach a harm reduction model, alcohol and also benzodiazepines do need a medical care to taper down because it, it can be very dangerous. A person could have strokes, um, a person could go into seizures, um, and it's very hard on the body. So sometimes, and just don't know that if you are struggling with alcohol or with benzodiazepines that you would want to get the consult of your doctor or a medical care provider or a licensed addiction professional like myself to be able to taper down safely because it could be fatal. So depending on the level of your use, um, a, a tapering down with alcohol might look like, you know, reducing the amount of, of beer or liquor that you intake. Maybe you start to put times around it and if a person has been drinking all day, maybe they stop drinking during work hours or taper down by particular hours of the day. It really depends on the substance, which is where having a, an addiction professional to be able to help because we're highly trained in what needs detox, what doesn't, where to send you as a referral, but it's really not about just complete abstinence for some people. It's about reducing harm. Um, so that can be quite a hard concept because in our society, it's like we have AA and we have all these wonderful support groups. We have the religious aspect. We have the moral aspect. We have some people who legitimately cannot drink at all or cannot use at all because they're, you know, from, from one to 20 in a very short period of time. So this is where it comes in about, you know, what do I need in my own life? What impact does my use or drinking have on my day to day? How impactful is that on me emotionally, cognitively? Am I failing to follow through on my tasks and my life's responsibilities? Like how big is this for me? So harm reduction for a person where it doesn't have a whole lot of impact, but you know, it's something that you could work on. You could start reducing, you know, by a glass of wine a night or a beer a night, or maybe even just questioning yourself from one drink to the next is like, what am I going to get out of this? Am I trying to escape or do I really just want to get drunk or do I feel like I have to have another drink? There's a lot of social elements that go into drinking as well. Mm -hmm. well I, 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 I appreciate that too. And, you know, I think Lori, you know, to just comment on that piece is the honesty that you have to have with yourself about the substance. There's this, um, I think that's kind of what it came has come down to for me over the last year is just the, I've got to start being really honest about this versus this, Oh, whatever I'll do with it tomorrow. Or, oh, I'm really only having one or two a night, but I'm having it in a glass that's this big. Um, <laughs> but just be really being able to understand like the why really, really it comes down to what's the reality of what's going on. Um, how is it going to impact me if I do start to work on this and, and try to make a difference? It doesn't mean that it has to be tomorrow that I never have a glass of wine again. Um, but also exactly what you said is what it, what am I getting out of it? What is the benefit? Now I can see the benefit of, of why I'm doing that in the first place in the evenings. I, I definitely see the benefit and I don't want to lose that. But why does it have to continue to go? And as I've started to be, be more self-aware about it and be more honest with myself about it, 
that's when I've started to really see that the harm reduction model could work for me. Um, another big piece, um, and then we're going to wrap up, but Lori, I want you to have some final words here. Another big piece is um, uh, forgiving myself and understand, like, oh my God, I might get emotional again. Um, <laughs> sorry. But like, just forgive myself for, you know, if I do, like, how I've perceived it before is like, you know, messing up or whatever, making a commitment and not being able to follow through that night. Like, I'm only going to have this much. Um, just trying to see either later that night or the next day, like, it's okay. That doesn't mean that you're a horrible person or this is a reflection of your character the same way. Like, I look at OCD. When I have these intrusive thoughts, it's not about me. It's not about my character. It's not about how strong or resilient I am. Sometimes it just becomes bigger than me. Yeah. And so um, really starting to practice some some forgiveness and some um, like self-love and self-care and mindfulness around, you know what, you really didn't, you weren't able to follow through last night with what you planned. So let's try again tonight, you know, or maybe you'd screw, you didn't, you didn't, you weren't able to do it all week, but let's try again next week. Um, so that's really helped me, even though like I'm crying, so it doesn't seem like it helped me and I'm still feeling shame. <laughs> um, to me, just like, like, just like OCD, it is, it, it is going to be a lifelong journey for me. And so to just really keep trying and not see it as a reflection that I'm a horrible person. Um, anyway, uh, but I do want Lori to kind of like have the final say here. And thank you so much, Lori, for being here and what you do for so many people and how many people that you help. And I hope that, um, I, you know, I hope that my the viewers are able to, you know, gather some of the information that she has. She's so knowledgeable and so um, empathetic um, towards all of us. So any, you know, kind of last words of advice, uh, comfort just from a therapeutic or even, you know, someone who's experienced um, close and loved ones that have um, dealt with substance use disorder that you want to leave with us. Absolutely. So I just want to speak to what you just said about this compassion and self-love and self-care is that that is all, you know, what my treatment plans and what my planning and relapse prevention planning with clients is about is like, this is about you. You need to take care of yourself. And oftentimes when there is a lapse or a relapse, whether it's OCD or whether it's addiction, it's like, oh, well, I have to try harder and now because I failed this thing, now I got to like up, up the, um, you know, the requirement and now I can't drink at all tonight. And we like kind of punish ourselves and we've learned to do that in our culture. And that is about that shame. And that is about that embarrassment and continues to reinforce the cycle of like not being able to talk about any of this stuff because you feel like a big piece of crap when really you're just a human and it didn't work that night and you do have to get up and start the next day, but you don't have to make the barrier so hard that you cannot jump over that hurdle, which is huge. And self-love and self-compassion. Like I I'm a therapist and I have to work on that all the time. <laughs> I do love myself, but sometimes I just want to smack myself on the hand and, you know, parent and do all of this stuff. That's like counterproductive. So, that is all was involved in the treatment plan is self-care strategies, new coping tools, new things to be dippy like, oh, I love myself and this is great. But it's really just like, wow, I can have compassion for myself in a time of need. Wow. I give myself credit for not bashing myself and trying again tomorrow. That's huge. So I think in general, in working with addiction and OCD, there is so much shame. And by having self-compassion, the first way that we can start to practice that is by having compassion for other people. By recognizing our own judgments that we have about alcohol or others' use or um, uh, others' who we see struggling where we say like oh that would never be me 
that's the time when you need to really call your own judgment and say like, wow, what would that be like to be that person? And I can, even in their time of pain and in their time of need, I can't see myself doing that, but I can understand that I'm 10 steps away from that happening. Anybody is. We're only a few steps away from decisions that could ruin our life. And that's not in a bad way, but like having that compassion and not judging in a way, not comparing ourselves to other people, which I know is really hard. Yes. <laughs> um, but we get in that role and in that game, like, wow, so and so's drinking is much more worse than mine. It is not. It goes back to you and what you need and what the impact is on your life. So start practicing compassion with other people in their situations. Practice using that language so that you can do it with, with yourself when you fail. And failure is okay. It has us get up, dust off, and keep going. But not get up, dust off, make the bar even higher so that we can't jump over it. There's a huge difference there. <laughs> I love that. I wrote notes down here on, on what you said, because I think it's, I think it's great. I'm going to drop it in the description of our video too. Lori, thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure. I just adore you. <laughs> and thank you to everybody who has tuned in today. Um, I really appreciate um, you taking the time to listen. And of course I'm going to click off of here and then I'm going to ruminate probably for the next four hours about how I should not have done the video. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm glad to share this part of my life with you. I'm going to make an effort to make it part of my videos moving forward. And um, I hope that it, it, if, if it didn't resonate with you, it can resonate in the way of maybe creating that, how you can create compassion for individuals who are in the situation like I'm in, where it's something that's been shameful for a while. Um, but as usual, uh, thank you for being here. Um, and if you have comments, drop them, drop them underneath. If you're looking for peer support or consultations for referrals um, for and therapists who do OCD either in your area or who will cross state or country lines, uh, please visit treatmentforocd.com or chrissyhodges.com for more information about my services and pricing. Um, or drop me an email at ocd.chrissie at gmail.com. I'm here to help provide support. Um, and referrals for you to get on that road to recovery. Thank you for being here. Um, and if you want to subscribe and then you'll get updates about when I post wonderful videos like this. Thank you, Lori, for being here. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next time.